Uh, the Reconomy Project was, was created to support and connect people uh, in transition groups who were asking questions uh, about the operation of their local, um, in local economy and then starting to experiment with things that they could do to create positive change in terms of the economic conditions in their, in their area. And these experiments, I mean, some of them represented on this slide, take very many forms. Uh, lots of them involve starting enterprises, often community energy, food enterprises are, are often some of the first that, that get started, and we're going to hear from some of those today. Um, many uh, transition groups start local currency projects, or something else, uh, other, other schemes or, or initiatives that are about supporting local businesses, um, building the market in their, in their area. And as they build their capacity and develop their relationships, because this is not something that you can do on your own, this has to be done with others in the community, as they build those relationships, they're starting to work on more, what you might call more strategic projects. So that look at ways of transforming the local economy. So looking at the, the types of infrastructure that are needed, uh, the facilities, the resources um, that help transit, what you might call transition type enterprises to start up, to thrive and to connect to each other because one of the, the wonderful possibilities that emerge when different enterprises with similar, with similar values start to work together and create more of a, of a network of, of, acti of activity. So what I'm going to do in my workshop, um, I'm going to share some of the learnings from the first phases of our project, of our of the economy project. I'm going to talk about what we've found, some of the challenges we've seen people experiencing, what seems to work, uh, you know, what, what proves difficult. I'm going to share with you some of the resources that are available to people that are uh, wanting to do these sorts of activities. Um, it's going to be interactive, lots of opportunities for you to ask questions, and basically we'll explore what feels most relevant to the group who turns up. Um, and I'm going to leave you with a slide uh, that's, that's trying to give you a flavour of a wider perspective. So, economy has spread from the UK uh, all over the world, and it's connecting up with many other movements and networks that are working on new economies. I mean, obviously, this isn't, we're not precious about the brand transition, uh, and there are many other people working in this space. Um, and I just wanted to give you a flavour of, of that with this slide. Uh, we now have active economy groups in Brazil, Croatia, Germany, Mexico, the Netherlands, Portugal, Sweden and the USA. Um, and they're holding meetings like this. Uh, not exactly like this because they all have their own flavour and, and approach. Uh, they're supporting activity very like the activity that we'll be talking about uh, today. And they're coming together either online, this is us at a, one of our online meetings, uh, uh, or very, very occasionally we actually meet in, per in person. This is us uh, in a car park in Copenhagen <laughs> with some people online. Uh, and there's a whole story behind that meeting. Um, and they, but they come together to share ideas and experience and collaborate on new projects that, that are uh, across distance. So I just wanted to, to pause now and say to you uh, that people all over the world, I've, I've been talking to some of these people in Mexico and Croatia just, just yesterday, people all over the world know that you're meeting here today. They're sending you their, their love and support and they're sharing the values, your values, and are doing some really similar stuff to what we'll be talking about in some really different contexts. And for me, there's something really rich there about how we can learn from each other and also understand the impacts of you know, what we're doing here in, in London, in the UK, how that's impacting on you know, our, our friends and colleagues in, in Mexico and India, etc. So, um, I just wanted to leave you with that thought. That's me. So we are Karen and Laura. And we set up and we run Crystal Palace Food Market, um, which we've been running since the 11th of May 2013. <laughs> it's a weekly food market. Um, and again, it was set up, as Lucy was saying, initially from an idea in, in, our, in our heads. Um, everything, in her head. it was a yeah. idea. <laughs> everything, of course, comes from ideas in our heads. 
and I had studied Ayurvedic medicine as a degree, um, which has a lot of Indian thinking in it. And um, part of that thinking is that everything comes from your mind. Every, everything is manifested from the mind. And I had thought for a long time, I want to have clean food. I want to know where my food comes from. I'm a food activist. I'm disgusted with the sort of food that most people in this country have to eat. I go into a supermarket, I would say 85% of what you see in there is going to make you sick. And I wanted access to food that wasn't going to make me sick. And that's why I came into transition, um, where we go into a place where we might be able to change things for the better. And I could meet other people that believed that maybe we could and had not got stuck into cynicism. Mm. And it was from that that we had a brainstorm. Mm. How could we bring more sustainably produced food into our little part of London? And I put my hand up and said, you can start a market. Yeah. And, and we all said in the first rule of transition, if it's your idea, you have to do it. And Karen was really new to the group then. And yeah. she went, all right, then I will. Yes. And then she made me do it with her. Yes. That's pretty much And I was so pleased. Yeah. yeah I'm so pleased. Yeah. So we're a principle-led market. We, we so totally set up on transition principles. We had done a permaculture course together. So it was the permaculture principles linked up with books like the transition book on local food that we used as our template. We spent a year um, galvanizing our own community and we're very much a sort of bottom-up market but principles led, as you can see from our sign. <laughs> That's a yeah. sort of, we're not a corporate type thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, so we'll just go through this very quickly. We, we didn't really get ourselves together in time to do slides. So we support small farms, um, small organic farms. They're as close by to us as is possible. Uh, this is um, Steve Cook, who's one of our farmers with one of his favourite cows. <laughs> and we're, um, and um, we have lots of lovely produce. We're mostly produce. Um, and as I said, they're all organic. We don't uh, expect that the, um, the produced food are all organic because we're trying to change the food system and if we only dealt with people who already agree with us we're not having much of an effect so our um, small businesses yeah. which Karen will talk about they don't have to be organic. So we're a weekly market and we're a produce market we have 22 stalls and we wanted to change people's shopping habits and you can't do that if you're monthly you have to be weekly and we have managed to do that to a large degree in Crystal Palace um, yeah, that's yeah. it. That's okay, fine. that's it. Oh, anyway, uh, we'll be telling you how, how we, did we did it, why we did it, and all yep. the rest of it. Thank you. <laughs> so we started from Transition Kentish Town. We're um, a transition town group in North London. We started way back now, I realise. It was like 2010. I sort of got the transition handbook for Christmas, and I was at home at my mum's farm in Devon reading it. And occasionally we sort of look up and go, we're at the top of an energy mountain, but the party's over and we have to come down. And then we're like, peel the potatoes. Um, but we, we basically set up that year, Transition Kentish Town. And right at the beginning, we kind of wanted, we were doing all marmalade making workshops and film showings and um, things to do with ditching clothes up and all that sort of thing. Quite frantic amount of activity back then. We wanted to do something that would uh, be quite visible, that would sort of lock in social change and would be uh, make money and would also um, be something that would appeal to people who didn't necessarily want to do transition. They just wanted to have a kind of purely economic relationship with her while also changing the world for the better, but uh, not, not making too much of a demand on them. So um, an email came out from Growing Communities, who are a venerable box scheme in East London, and um, we thought that was probably our opportunity. We, a lot of our projects were food-based, so um, we signed a memorandum of understanding with them. And that's the team of growing community. They're really cool. We went to see them, got really excited by their passion. And then we started off our own box scheme. How long have I got? One minute. Um, and so one of the first things we did was visit our farm. So these were our first two partner farms, Ripple Farm in Kent and Calabar, they're in South London. And um, the... It's good going to farm, you kind of, you know, you get more sense. That's a leak and it's in the ground and they sort of, you know, Martin is very enthusiastic about potatoes 
that was an early point in our decision to make everyone eat potato rather than give them the option not to have potato. So um, it shaped the scheme. And then here we are making potato superheroes, in fact, for one of our first meetings, inspired by Rob Hopkins. Um, so we set it up, we set up as a consumer, a consumer cooperative. Um, we're member-led, we're community-focused. And one of the great things about this growing community scheme is that um, they aren't trying to roll themselves out nationally. They're not trying to be a franchise. They want local communities to set up models like their own. And that really attracted us, because each one of us little baby bedbot schemes have been, you know, we're all different, we're all in our different communities. Um, this is a picture of us all packing last week, well I'm not in this picture, um, in our yard in, in, in North London. So um, we set up in 2012, I think, when we got there, and one of the only things was that um, it was only when I started taking time out of my day job and actually putting a day a week towards it, basically giving up that money and trying to start new money, that it actually started to take off. Um, and then four, four and a half years later, we're 170 members, and um, uh, we pack, uh, we have like 10 collection points, and we have quite a lot of fun every week packing vegetables and distributing them. So in my session, I'm just going to talk to you more about Kentish Town Red Pot, uh, hoping some other people might want to set up similar schemes, and it's all marvellous. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about community energy and a revolution that's happening. There aren't many times you can say the energy market is transforming, but now is one of them. Has anybody heard of, um, how do I get to my next slide? Has anybody heard of Dr. Mary Gilley and the energy local innovation? Oh my God, this is going to be complicated. Look up energy local. Um, next slide, please. There's a fantastic website, a um, little video of something happening in Wales in Bethesda. And the local National <coughs> Trust hydro station would normally sell its electricity to the grid for about 4.85 pence. But 85 people have now got smart meters from the co-op and they're buying that electricity for 7 pence. Does that make sense? On, they, they can go on a website and they can say, it's 9 o'clock in the morning, your electricity is costing you 12 pence, wait half an hour and you'll pay 9.5 pence. It's raining, the stream is rushing, put your washing machine on. It's difficult, isn't it? Anyway, so my role, um, or one of them, is to roll out this concept of solar energy in the south. So here's how it works. You find 150 people on the same grid, you switch to a supplier, you get as much solar power in that space as you can. Now you need a 30 kilowatt center, a nucleus, which could be a school or a community building or a church that has a 100 kilowatt meter and then you pool the generation because at the moment the feed-in tariff is about two and a half pence. So it's not going to be viable to put solar panels on your roof. But if you can get eight or nine pence from it, it suddenly becomes an economic model that is transferable. So my workshop will be about, you know, community energy's had a really tough time in the last year. But actually, it's still viable. Is anybody a shareholder for and any of the Energy for All co-ops? OK, a few of you. Energy for All started with Baywind. There's about 24 different energy generating co-ops. There's about 15,000 investors around the company, around the country. Um, they've raised about 30 million. I I'm, I'm, used to be a freelance journalist. I'm partly making this stuff up, but it's... <laughs> um, I'm convinced. All right. <laughs> OK. They're sitting on 50 million pounds worth of capital assets, wind farms, solar farms. They're getting returns that are guaranteed for 20 years. If they registered as a bank, they would be AAA rated. There's only one other AAA rated organization in Britain at the moment. Britain isn't AAA rated. It's Cambridge, for some bizarre reason. Um, they're sitting there with money to invest in the next generation of community energy. 
So if you can think of a school or a community building or a church that could be the start of one of these projects, you know, it's doable. Um, schools on their own, even without Energy Local, if they use 80 to 90% of their electricity and pay around eight to nine pence, they can, it's, it's a viable proposition. Uh, yes, this is Chris Rowland. I work for Revesco, which stands for Ooze Valley Energy Services Company in the River Ooze, flows through the town of Lewis, and I'm in Transition Town Lewis. And Transition Town Lewis got started in 2007, so this will be our 10th year, and I've been a part-time employee of Revesco for nearly 10 years now. Um, we started off with um, uh, energy fairs, we built a bicycle which is recycled with power's lights, took that to schools, we have eco open houses, uh, we got involved with schools racing electric cars, and we tried to promote local micro-generation. We worked with Lewis District Council on a grant scheme which got uh, solar thermal panels, wood-burning stoves, and some PV on the roof of about 250 buildings in the Lewis District. And we also took about 1,000 calls and uh, directed people to help with uh, insulation from their homes when there was free insulation uh, available for homeowners. Next slide. Uh, this is our first project, which we set up as an industrial and provident society for community benefit, now called uh, Community Benefit Societies. And we raised uh, about £350,000 to install solar panels on the roof of our local brewery, Harvey's Brewery. Um, and we raised more than enough from that project that we went on to then install solar panels at Priory School, Brickyard Farm, Bark and Nursery, which is our local veg box scheme. We raised some more money, installed solar panels at Cheney School, raised some more money and then uh, installed solar panels at Wallen School and Ringmer Community College, which is a Ashton Award winner. And Avesco got a national award in 2014. If none of you have heard of Ashton, please look it up. It's a fantastic organisation. As you can see from this, the price here was £306,000 for nearly 100 kilowatts, and it's dropped now to considerably less. So the price of PV panels has dropped enormously, but so has the feeding tariff. When we started out at the beginning, you'd get about 38 pence per kilowatt hour for the feeding tariff. Now you can get about 5p. What that means is now if you do a project with PV panels on the roof of the school, you have to sell them the electricity. When we started out, we could give Harvey's Brewery free electricity, which saves them about £6,000 a year on their electricity bill. Now we have to sell Ringwood Community College electricity at about 8 pence to make up for the fact that the feed-in tariff is so low. But it is still possible to do these projects at around about 30 to 50 kilowatts on a building like a school. Okay, next. Oh, one other thing, just on that slide back there, we're part of an organisation, so is Richard, called Community Energy South, which links community energy groups across the southeast so that we can support each other. Uh, next slide, this is a project that um, Avesco got involved with, with Celesco, which is the group which we mentored, and another organisation called Mongoose Energy, which spun out of Bath and West Community Renewables, and we raised uh, uh, 1.2 million pounds to invest in a five megawatt solar farm just south of Chichester. Uh, the rest of the money came from bank finance, and this was built by Solar Century. And here are some of the investors on Community Energy Fortnight, which had the day where the investors went to visit the solar farm. That's up and running now, and we're looking to refinance that with another share issue probably towards the end of the year. So if anybody's interested in investing in a solar farm, we're going to put out a share issue for that. Um, and the whole thing for us has been about scaling up, going from rooftop to solar farms when there's an opportunity to do that. Can't do solar farms at the moment, might come back again when PV panel prices drop and electricity prices rise again. We're now concentrating on solar for schools in Sussex or East Sussex and we're trying to identify about 20 schools where we can do a share issue for them. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the challenges at the moment of using the feed-in tariff, having power purchase agreements, setting up a community benefit society in order if a transition group wants to get involved with community energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Hi, I'm Michael Stewart from Transition Town Council of Kilburn. Um, I'm Sophia Flucker, I'm a colleague of Michael's at Transition Council of Kilburn. Do you want to speak up a little bit? Yeah. So Council of Kilburn is in Brent in northwest London. This is the story with a twist at the end of an empty 12,000 square foot pub, which I reckon is about three or four times the size of this room. So it's a pretty big pub. We're averagely reasonably active transition town doing some food growing, some fruit harvesting, air pollution things, restart parties and a few other things. We had the pleasure of a visit from Rob Hopkins about a year ago and we asked him at the end of that visit, how can we get the next step up? to be a bit more like Totnes. 
and he said two things. One was livelihoods and one was a hub, premises. And so we took the hub idea. We knew about this empty pub in the middle of our area in Queen's Park. I have to admit, I didn't get it at first because we don't do that much to fill all that space. But we quickly had a vision which was bringing in projects locally that we knew of. So a bicycle repair project was one that had already had space that they use. A refugee catering enterprise was another one. And one of our members want, works from home and wanted an opportunity for people working from home, self-employed or small businesses, to get together to have some co-working space. That was a third use. Fourth use was somebody who was really keen on furniture making and upcycling, and people using hand tools and learning skills. And then, because it was a pub, we actually ended up being forced to provide a bar was one of the ideas. And that was an idea that got a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, Transition Town was an enabler of this. We weren't going to do it all, um, but we were going to help make it happen. We worked with the local council and we got uh, business rates relief, planning, uh, premises license, the funding was going to come from business, business rates relief. Um, what happened in the end was we figured that the, after six months of conversation with the developer and not actually getting it signed, we figured we were being used, unfortunately, all along. So we will be able to tell you about how to spot a developer who is not genuine. Um, we've learnt a lot in six months of planning this. We had 400 people on a mailing list, we had a planning group of 20 people, we had a board. So we're going to keep looking for somewhere else and actually that six months, when we find somewhere else that's empty, not as big, but somewhere, we'll be able to move much quicker and make it happen. But certainly it's given a boost to our area to have this plan, this vision, this idea and a lot of people who were not involved in, we've met new people and uh, got a lot more ideas of, of what to do and how having this, doing this might change an area and bring a, really bring a community together by having a space. Anything else I've missed? Um, I, I suppose I'd say it's, it's not all bad news. Um, I think it really, it really highlighted the need for this space, the enthusiasm behind it. So um, I think yeah, we're, we're looking forward to, to actually making it happen. We, we nearly got there. So Transition Town Brixton has been around for a while and it's spawned a number of rather amazing projects which are all now separate organisations like uh, the Remakery, our reuse centre, Brixton Pound, uh, Brixton Energy, Action on Energy sadly closed in December so if anybody wants to move to South London and do energy efficiency there's a, there's a gap which Brixton Energy is, uh, is working on supplying at the moment. So you can talk to me about all of those. Uh, next please. But our economy work started in 2012, really, when we were visited by Fiona Ward from the Reconomy Project and kind of thought, this is an amazing theme to use as, an, as a unifier for all our disparate and separate projects, which maybe don't sing transition as loud as they might. Um, <clears throat> but in 2013, we were unexpectedly given some funding to, do, um, part, to be part of the, what has been, become known as the... Um, the economic blueprint work and we produced two reports on the real benefits to local people of localising the food and the energy economy. Uh, so I will outline some of that. Um, amazing, it's a no-brainer. Um, and next please. And out of that uh, we tried to begin to action some of the things in our three-year action plan. Um, we held workshops about about how we can make transition our livelihoods, uh, about how we can network local food and how we, we wanted to set up a, a local energy partnership to get all the different people working, even if they don't know they're working, like roofers on energy, um, together. And that hasn't happened, may still. Next, please. Um, in 2014, we again unexpectedly got some funding to uh, start to make uh, Reconomy real. Uh, and that was around supporting community and transition enterprises into being and to be successful. Uh, and we agreed to be the first uh, iteration of the local uh, entrepreneur forum, which uh, Top Ness had been pioneering since 2013, I think. Um, and uh, we did that in 2015, five local enterprises speaking to the community of Dragons, 150 local people in the room, to, to say what they needed to move to the next stage. It was an amazing event, and it, it kind of... Um, 
it, afterwards, it was a little bit of a kind of, oh, right now, what do we do next? <laughs> and what we decided was that we could just do that again. It, it, it's a lot of work, but we decided we'd take a step back and try and build a more grassroots next, please, um, approach to the economy. Uh, oh, there isn't a slide there. So I'll tell you about that in the workshop. Uh, and what we've done is work with the um, Impact Hub Brixton to, to have a weekly event called an Open Project Night, uh, open for any community or ent entrepreneur um, to come and organise and connect with the, the community, get ideas, get criticism, and, and build their power. Um, and uh, we've done some small lefts in that. Uh, and now we're working on the Brixton, uh, uh, we're working on the Bank of Lambeth uh, and various initiatives to do with making uh, um, local money go to work locally, but also fundamentally um, encouraging community investment, not just of money. Thank you. Maybe see you later. <laughs>